Well, we've reached our last chapter, dear students. And this chapter combines retirement planning and estate planning. So we'll spend the first presentation discussing retirement planning, which in some ways will be a bit of a review and recap of some themes that have gone through the entire class. We'll then have a quick presentation on a fun topic, the baby boomer generational time bomb, which sounds kind of scary, but in reality isn't as bad as people make it out to be. And then we'll have our last presentation on the last and final chapter of life. And that's death. <laughs> Ooh. Estate planning. We don't call it death planning. We call it estate planning. But let's turn our attention now to retirement planning. By 2030, 76 million baby boomers will have retired. But only 46 million Gen Xers will have come up to replace them. Hmm, what's going on? Well, we'll see. We'll see in our second presentation. But right now, let's take a look at an off heard lament of senior citizens. If I knew I was going to live this long, I would have done things a whole lot differently. Uh -huh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know what I'm going to, you, you already know what I'm going to tell you to do, right? So, but let's do it anyway. Slide number two. Why should you think about retirement planning now? I'm talking to you millennials in your early 20s or maybe even earlier. Well, What's happening? People are spending more years, 16 to 20 years in retirement. Uh, sound like a test question? Yeah, 16 to 20 years in retirement. It used to be two or three. Right, people used to retire at 62 and die at 64. Or retire at 65 and, and die at 67. Or maybe not even make it to 65. But that was 70 years ago, folks. People are living far longer now. And so we have to prepare. It's a great problem to have, isn't it? I think so. It's a great problem to have. A private pension plan and social insecurity, I'm sorry, social security, are most often insufficient to cover the cost of living. And people are saying, what private pension plan? They're all disappearing and being replaced by defined contribution plans but the news as we'll discuss as we'll discuss is not so bad it's not so bad inflation may the book says no 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 inflation will diminish the purchasing power of your retirement savings inflation doesn't retire when you retire it's a given and over the last 80 some odd years it's been two three percent so there are times when it goes up higher than that most notably the 70s and into the very early 80s. But for the most part, that's what it's been. And it will diminish your purchasing power. If we continue at 3% in about 25 years, remember the rule of 72? Prices will have doubled. Slide number three. How do you estimate your retirement living expenses? Well, it's not easy. It really is not easy. And p most people find that they were way off. <laughs> they either thought they needed more than they really need, or they found out they, they needed a lot less than they, they thought they were going to need. Spending patterns will change. Some expenses may go down or stop. Work, clothing, housing, income taxes. But other expenses will probably go up, such as medical or leisure. And in some families, it's just given. It's, it's it's expected that the grandparents are going to be giving gifts and contributions and possibly paying for private school. I'm glad I don't have that in my family. For the, for the grandchildren, paying, paying for private school for the grandchildren. Inflation will raise the amount you need to cover your expenses over your probable how many years? 16 to 20 or more years in retirement. The tricky wild card, in my humble opinion, is health care. It is the only thing that truly scares yours truly, and with respect to my wife and my retirement. That's the only thing that really scares me is health care, because 
as we discovered in chapter 9, it's out of control, and any kind of uh, bipartisan attempts to solve the health care crisis are, have been, so far, totally uh, destroyed by partisanship. So, we'll see. That's what scares me. Everything else I got covered. Thank you very much. Slide number four. Here is the Bureau of Labor Statistics take on the average, whatever that is, how older, 65 and up, household, and how it spends its money. And this, to me, is a real tragedy, that the average elderly person spends about a third on housing. That's what you should be spending while you're working, not when you're not working. And uh, if you've bought, purchased a house and paid down the debt, this should go way down. Now, there are always going to be costs to housing, folks. I mean, you can't, you don't live free. But if you can uh, pay that mortgage down, maybe, you know, as we said, show as we showed in, in uh, Chapter 7, pay it a little bit faster than 30 years, you should have that housing down. I think this one, medical, is going to be higher because we're living longer. And do you remember the statistic? People from ages 60 to 70 use more health care services, more health care dollars than they did from age 0 to 59. Food and entertainment and insurance and contributions and transportation. Now, here's another thing that to me seems a little too much for retirement. You don't need a car. You certainly don't need two cars. And who knows what will happen with these driverless cars. Someday you won't want a car. You will just log in and say, I need a car at this time to take me here. The, the thing will show up without a driver you'll pop in and it'll take you to where you want to go and then it'll go off and do it for somebody else I think it's gonna be a winner we'll see but I tease my wife and say wouldn't you like to sell your car in retirement and she goes well, you can sell your car so I did <laughs> and we share um, well actually we it, we we have another vehicle that that's only used for mostly used for carting stuff around and and we'll use that when we need to to cart ourselves around, but it's mostly it's a minivan that we use to cart our, cart stuff around. Slide number five: planning your retirement housing. Where are you going to live? Consider the cost of living. Consider the taxes. But the truth is, dear students, that most people, six out of seven, will prefer to remain in their homes because after 30 years, it's not just a house; it's your home. You might have raised your kids there. Yes, so so it's 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 not some place that people normally want to leave. Some people will, but six out of seven will remain in their homes. And a reverse mortgage, which we said we talked a little bit about in chapter seven, be careful. These things are potential landmines because they love to prey on the elderly. But these things can help people live in their homes for the remainder of their life because the mortgage, unlike, the reverse mortgage, unlike a regular mortgage, cannot be foreclosed upon. So they can't kick you out. If you choose to leave, they're going to want to be paid. So you're going to have to sell the house or sometimes the, the heirs, the children or the grandchildren, will refinance so they can keep the house. But you cannot be kicked out while you're still alive. And if you do choose to go to a continuing care retirement community, you will find that these things have gotten very good, folks. They're really amazing. They, you get a little apartment. Sometimes they're not a little. Sometimes they're very uh, spacious. And you don't have to go to the community uh, uh, gathering where they have dinner. And you can do your own laundry. You can do your own cleaning. Or as your needs increase, you can have food brought to you. Or go to the to the common area for meals and and you know social gatherings and entertainment, and then you can hire staff to help you clean and do your laundry. So they're they're amazing. We um we were involved with one with my mother-in-law, and I, we, I was impressed. I was impressed. Now here's something that I have talked with people in the past and done, 
done my best to try to convince them because once you leave San Diego, if you sell your place, it's going to be really hard for you to get back in. So if you do want to relocate, my advice is to research carefully and rent your home for at least a year, maybe two. Because if you sell the home in San Diego, it will be very difficult no matter where you go, unless you go someplace more expensive like the Bay Area and, or New York. But, but no, it's going to be very difficult for you to come back. So my advice would be to rent for a year or two. And more and more Americans are retiring abroad. <laughs> Costa Rica, anyone? Well, careful. You think you're not going to have to pay your income taxes, but that's not true. Unless you renounce your citizenship, you're going to have to pay your, your income taxes. You don't have to pay state income taxes anymore. Health care is, is a serious issue. And if you do not pay into Medicare, while you're gone, which makes sense, you know, I'm not, I'm not using it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm out of the country. But then if you come back and, and say you're going to, I want to join Medicare now. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. They're going to make you go back and pay as if you had been in the system, right? They're not going to say, you know, you, it's great. You go ahead and go have fun while you're still healthy. And then you come back when you're sick. No, we're not going to play that game. So you have to be careful. Talk with the Social Security. Talk with the Medicare um, uh, expert. You know, at the at the agency, I met several people in Morelia, Mexico, which is a beautiful Me Mexican city. It looks like Europe. It's absolutely gorgeous, and most Americans have never heard about it. Who were living off of their Social Security alone, very comfortably, very comfortably in Morelia, and they were buying the um, the Mexican health insurance. At least one was. I forget what the other person did. I asked them because I'm, you know, I'm very interested whenever I hear people saying that they've retired abroad. I want to know how it's going. Costa Rica is very popular. Ecuador is popular. Many go to the Philippines. What's the Baguio? Baguio is the is the place where there's lots of expats there living there. Um, uh, Thailand. So certain places in Europe. Most of Europe is very expensive, but some places are not. And so. Um, Think about it. Think about it. Slide number six. Social insecure Social Security. Social Security. Uh, you know, folks, when they ask millennials if they believe whether or not they will see a Social Security's check or whether or not they will see an alien in their lifetime, more Peop, more millennials believe they will see an alien spacecraft, UFO, in their lifetime than a Social Security check. And this is unfortunate because, you know, Social Security is not perfect. Nothing we humans ever have. But it's been darn good. Here's the problem with Social Security. When it was designed, it was never meant to be the sole source of retirement income. They called it one leg of a three or four legged stool. They still wanted people to own a home, real estate. They wanted people to save for retirement and have a pension plan. And yet somewhere along the line, people got it in their little heads that, no, I don't have to worry about retirement. I got social security. And now we're at the point where it's been bad mouthed so much that people say it's not going to be around. Well, that's ridiculous. It will be around. It will change. It will have to change. But we've faced problems before and we'll fix them. And that more about this when we get to the next presentation about uh, the baby boom generation and, and um, you know, its retirement. So full benefits are were originally at age 65, but they've moved up for younger folks to 67. And you can... Uh, get an earnings and benefits statement once you turn a certain age they send it to you and you can you can always um uh go online and ask for them to send it to you and so uh don't worry folks social security will be around but it is not your sole source in fact you should consider it a minor part no more than 15 20 percent you'll see that the social security administration 
recommends about a quarter, 25, 26%. But you should not count on this as your sole source of income. Okay? All right. Slide seven. When it was originally designed and, inst and, and, and started back in the uh, th late 30s, the full benefits were accrued at 65. And then when you were born at 68, then, then you see it going up to 65 years and two months, four months. And then until finally 1960, you have to wait until 67 to be fully vested. Now, does that mean you have to wait until 67 years of age to actually take your Social Security? No. You can take it at 62, but it will be reduced substantially. Well, that makes sense. It's an actuarial uh, uh, calculation. In, in many ways, folks, it's like an annuity. Remember we discussed annuities? It's like an annuity. The Social Security Administration looks at how long you're going to live. Well, actually, it was the Congress that, that, that mandated these and I'm sure they had plenty of help from the folks at Social Security. But, but the, if you take the money early, 62, or before, before the year you become uh, fully vested, you're going to take a hit. Every year after that, if you hang on, you'll, your amount will go up 8% a year, which is a you know, tidy little sum until you hit 70, and then it doesn't make sense for you to not take it anymore because it doesn't go up anymore. And you'll hear countless arguments, people yelling back and forth at one another whether you should take it early or take it late, and and it's such a it's not a it's 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 a very very difficult decision, and it and it's totally dependent upon your situation. I have helped people with this, and what I do is create a little spreadsheet that shows people how long they have to wait to catch up if they if they start taking it at 62 versus 65. How long would you have to wait if you started taking it at 65 before it caught up to what you were making with 62? And sometimes it's, you know, not until you're 80 or 78 or 84 and people say, well, I'll take it now. Or they say, no, 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 I'm going to hang on. A lot of it depends on you. It, all of it depends on you. Everyone is different. Slide number eight. Now, I want you to write these two phrases down because people can't remember them. I know they're, they're not the best phrases. Defined benefit. And the next slide is defined contribution. Okay, so so write those two. I write them on the board in the face-to-face -face class because I want people to remember them. Most people call, not most, but many people call the defined benefit plan a traditional benefit plan or a traditional pension plan. And this is what most employers used to offer their employees. The employer will pay you a certain amount per month when you retire based on your pre-retirement salary, how long you've worked, and your age. When I first started teaching at Southwestern, I was only going to be there for one semester. It was a temporary position. And they give you all the packages, and I'm looking at this thing, and I'm looking at the state teacher's retirement system, CalSTRS, and, you know, my pay, I, I took a 20% pay cut, but... I figured, eh, what the hell, one semester, what are they going to do, fire me? I didn't know what I was doing. And <laughs> and I'm looking at this state teacher's retirement system, and I'm thinking, you know, this is not bad. This is not bad. This is pretty darn good. And the idea, this was a long time ago, folks, was that, yes, you are earning less money than your um, uh, private employee counterparts. That's why we're offering you a good pension because you're not going to have the same opportunity to build up your, your nest egg that somebody who's making a, you know, a, quite a bit more than you are. And so that was one. I'm not the only, but that was one of the decisions, one of the factors in my decision. The major factor is I just love to teach. I just absolutely love it. I can't imagine not doing it, even though I have my hands in other things out in the industry. I think that's important, but my true love is teaching. And so I thank you, Southwestern Community College and CalSTRS. Now, what has happened? Right, it's become a political <laughs> a football because many of the pension plans that were, and some of them were much more generous than the public pension plans, they're going away. The employers don't want them anymore. And so now the, 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 uh, the, pub, the private employees have pension envy. 
they say, why should the public employees have this good pension? And, and you know, it's a, it's a question that needs to be raised and, and discussed intelligently. It won't be, don't worry. <laughs> and why are employers getting rid of these things? Well, for the very same reason we talked about a few few slides ago, why you need to start thinking now. Because people are living longer. It's a great problem to have, but it's still a problem that we have to deal with. With these traditional pension, plan, pension plans, these defined benefit plans, the employer made the decisions for you and their contributions. So you make contributions, they make contributions, but no matter what happens to the investments, the benefit stayed the same unless the fund goes belly up, which some did. For some of them, it was because the company raided. They literally raided the pension plans and then went bankrupt and said, sorry, we're bankrupt. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of hanky-panky in this industry. I apologize. But Social Security is an example of a defined benefit plan. It is based on how much money you make, how long you worked, and your years at when you retire. Now, the other one that is becoming much more popular is defined contribution plan. And I want you to remember that they're also called employer pension plans. And although 401k plan is just one of many types of employer pension plans, it's certainly the one that gets the most uh, press, gets the most notoriety, and they have become very popular. And why? Because as we said, the employers are just very reticent to take on an employee as a retiree who might live 30 some odd years or more. So who are they putting the onus on to save for your retirement? You! <laughs> with money pension purchase pension plans with stock bonus plans with profit sharing plans and the one that we just said is gaining the most popularity the 401k's the 403b's and, and why are they called 401k 457 403b 401a where did, these are sections of the internal revenue code that allow an employer to set up this plan and if you do what you're supposed to do and your employer does what they're supposed to do, the IRS blesses and kisses, Domini, Domini, Sanctus, Sanctus, Spiritus. You don't have to pay taxes until you retire. They are tax deferred. And they allow the employer to make non-taxable contributions called the match. The truth is, dear students, as we've tried to show you over and over again, if you start early, if you are consistent, if you are prudent, and you don't panic, you have the opportunity to have an income that far exceeds anything the pension plan's ever going to pay you. The opportunity for tremendous success in retirement is there. Ah, right. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say next. The opportunity for screwing up royally is also there. Because if you don't um, contribute, uh, or if you uh, contribute a little bit and think, oh, okay, I don't have to worry, or if you do what a lot of people do and wait till the market goes way up and then put all their money on red number seven, the aggressive growth fund, and then the market falls 50% and they lick their wounds and pull it out and put it back in the money market account only to watch the market turn around and go up 70%. You, you, yeah. In other words, you are responsible. And there are going to be some serious winners and there's going to be some serious losers. And it is my sincerest desire that you are amongst the greatest of the winners. Stick with us, kids. We'll show you how we already did i hope and if you, you know you always ask me you can always ask me more questions but you went by going through chapters 11 12 and 13 and the uh, and the and the um alternative the uh, real estate you can set yourself up pretty darn well providing the world doesn't end so we go to the irs and we say you know irs 401k 403b those are really dumb names 
can't you come up with a better name? And they say, oh, yes, yes, we call them salary reduction plans. Uh, <laughs> you gotta love the folks at the IRS. That's what I want. I want my salary reduced. Mm, all these things are tax deferred, or at least used to be, until the option, which we often call the Roth 401k, the Roth 403b, that's not the real names. There is a Roth IRA, that is in the law, but there's no Roth 401k in the, in the law. That's just what everybody calls them because they operate like a Roth IRA, which we'll, we'll describe this uh, in detail later on. Um, but those are after-tax contributions, and they're pretty cool, and we'll discuss those in a moment. So, how do you estimate your retirement living income? It ain't easy. It ain't easy. There are every financial website now has these retirement calculators, and really, are they all they are, folks, are uh, marketing tools. You type in all this in. No, that's not true. Some of them are actually quite good. These two, the American Funds and the T Rowe Price, are pretty darn good. Vanguard's is good. Fidelity, I've tried that one. That's okay. I thought it was good. Uh, I like I like American T Rowe Price better. But remember, everybody's different, and. And what they do is they ask you all these questions and you put in your numbers and you tell them what you think you're going to have to spend in retirement. And it comes back and says, you're not saving enough here. Talk to one of our representatives. <laughs> but, uh, but no, try them. See if they help. The, 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 the problem here is, folks, is not only are there a lot of variables about how much you're going to spend, health and the like, you don't know how long you're going to live. You just don't know. And that's why those traditional... Uh, pension plans and those annuities are just so tempting because you can't outlive the income. It doesn't matter in the case of the annuities that they're going to give you a lousy income. It just They just love that guarantee from the insurance company. So we have the longevity calculator that we saw back in Chapter 10, right? How long do you think you're going to live? You don't know. And as we said, Social Security starts sending you these estimated benefits at age 60, but uh, you can re uh, request one at any time. So let's now turn our attention to the types of retirement accounts. And we're going to do a little bit of review, but go more into depth. Because back in Chapter 11, we described the difference between a taxable and a uh, tax-qualified account. So we're going to take a look at those yet again. There are two major types. Sounds like a test question pre-tax and post-tax. The pre-tax are the older ones. And those are the 401ks, the 403bs, the 457s, the 401as, the TSP for the Federal Employees Thrift Savings Plan, a very good uh, 401k, by the way. The traditional IRA used to just be called an IRA, but now it's called the traditional IRA, so to differentiate it from the Roth IRA, which was named after a guy named William Roth. A SEP IRA, a simple IRA, a KEO for self-employed people. They all basically work the same way, although there are differences between, the, between them. You get a tax break now. You get to deduct the contributions from your income tax. The money grows tax deferred, meaning you don't have to pay any taxes on it until you retire. And then you're taxed in retirement. In Starting in 1998, the Roth IRA came along. And then in 2006, the Roth 401k, the Roth 403b came along. But your company does not have to offer it. They don't have to offer it. And how does this work? Well, it's, it's the opposite. Instead of getting a tax break now, you get a tax break later in retirement. Very cool. Yes, very cool. And we will take a look at that in detail. But first, let's review this slide. Did this look familiar? Indeed, right. We discussed this in Chapter 11. Taxable accounts have no limits on the types of investments. Now, I crossed out the ones I think you should stay far away from, folks. But that doesn't mean you will. You can if you want. If you're that so inclined, go right ahead and do options. I wish you a lot of luck. And there's no limit on the, the amount of money you can put in. And every year, if you make money, you're going to get a 1099, which says to the IRS, okay, I made X amount in dividends, X amount in interest, X amount in, um, in uh, capital gains. And if it's real estate, rent, exactly. 
So you pay taxes every year. The retirement accounts are tax qualified accounts. Tax qualified is what the IRS calls them. And they limit, the Congress limits the, the types of retirement investments you can put in there. Why? Because they don't want you gambling with your retirement. Stocks and stock mutual funds are risky enough, dear students, right? And so are some bonds. But they don't want you to play fast and loose with futures, options, shorting, things that are just really, really scary. They also put strict limitations on your contributions. And if you remember back in Chapter 3, I asked you to do a little research. And we'll, we'll give you the numbers again if you don't remember. They don't want people putting a million dollars into these things. Sometimes on a, in an exam, I'll tell you, or an assignment, what would you do with 100000 I would put it in my Roth IRA. Right? No, you won't. <laughs> okay, don't do that. Because first of all, the company will kick it back and say, sorry, we, 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 our business rules say we can't do this. Uh, and if you do, are successful, the IRS will eventually, it'll take them a long time, folks. They work slowly. They'll send you, send you a friendly little letter, official business only, saying, you goofed. You got to take a bunch of that money out now. And if you don't, we're going to penalize you 6% every year you leave it in. Uh huh. <laughs> and so, if you do what you're supposed to do, only invest in the things that are allowed, only invest a certain amount every year, the IRS is going to allow you to defer those taxes. You can usually take the contributions and write them off your taxes, give you a tax break now not have to pay taxes every year until you retire. In the case of the Roth IRA, the Roth 401k, the Roth 403b, you don't get a tax break now, but it's tax-free. Very cool. So let's get started on the individual retirement arrangement. Is that its real name? Yeah, believe it or not, that's the real name. It's actually called an individual retirement arrangement, but nobody except the IRS calls it that. Everybody else calls it the individual retirement account. It is by far the most popular personal retirement plan. It is now called the traditional IRA to differentiate it from the Roth IRA, so it didn't used to be called that. And anyone with earned income can contribute. There's a little bit of confusion, as we'll see, because Sometimes your contributions are not tax deductible. You can't pull them off your taxes in any one year for a certain reason, which we'll discuss in a moment. But no matter what, you can always contribute. Doesn't matter how much money you make, you make a million bucks. They're confusing it with the Roth IRA, which says you can't, but you really can. It's going to get confusing. But if you have a retirement plan at work, a, an employer sponsored plan, such as a 401k or one of the other options, and you make over a certain amount, then you can still contribute, but you can not deduct it off your taxes. Do you understand? So that's the confusion. You go ahead and contribute. It becomes a non-deductible contribution. And then it gets a little tricky because then you have to keep track of that. Because when you go to take the money out, the IRS is going to say, well, it's all taxable. You say, no, 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 I already paid taxes on the way in. So you have to remember how much was non-taxable, pre, you know, post-tax, or it was already paid taxes on, and how much is deferred, how much is pre-tax, which means you have to pay taxes on that. It gets a little tricky, and you have to keep your end-of-year statements in perpetuity, in my humble opinion. The contributions limit limits are increasing with uh, inflation. They're up to $5,500 in 2016, and your investment grows tax-deferred. You pay taxes on the money as you withdraw it once you're retired, normally at age 59 and a half, but you, there is a way for you to do it early. You just have to make a deal with the IRS and say, I'm going to retire, I'm 56 years old, and they say, okay, this is how, they look at your account, say, this is how much you can take out, in fact, this is how much you have to take out for the next five years. And if you decide you want to go back to work, sorry, you've already made the deal. You have to keep taking this money out. Bizarre, but that's how it works. So if you wait until 59 and a half, then you, don't, then you don't have to worry about that. Once you hit 70 and a half, with most of these plans, you have to start taking the money out. And if you don't, you can get hit with huge penalties. 50% of what you were supposed to have taken out. If, there's a formula depending on your age and how much is in the account. And if you were supposed to take out, for example, $1,000, 
and you don't do it. They'll make you take out the $1,000 and hit you with a $500 penalty. Now, I have found instances where seniors have not done this, and I have said, you know what, start doing it now. You know, do it this year, don't delay, and the IRS never goes. I think they must think this is horrible. This is a horrible way to treat seniors. Uh, uh, so, so, but that doesn't mean you should tempt the fates. You know, you don't. You want to know about it, and you want to do what the law says to do. But I just think it's an awful way to treat people, and I think the IRS agrees with me. I think they basically, okay, they started doing it this year. Let's let them slide. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just guessing. But we'll find. If I find somebody who actually got hit with it, I'll tell you. Slide 14. And the IRA has so many cousins and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. The 401Ks, the 403Bs, the 457s, the thrift savings plans. Look at that limit. $18,000, folks. And if you're 50 or over, $6,000. Oh, by the way, did I tell you an extra 1000 if you're 50 or over for the, tr the traditional IRA and the Roth? I apologize if I did. And... Um, that's eighteen thousand dollars a year. You're a married couple in your twenties, and you both have good jobs. Live off the one salary, put the entire other salary into a four hundred one k. Do it for five years. Invest prudently with an eye toward long term growth, and you will never have to put another dime away for your retirement, unless the world ends. And people don't believe me. I've had a couple of students say, what are you talking about? That won't work. And, yeah, and I, I show them the illustrations. I say, well, this is what's happened in the past. It's not a guarantee of what's going to happen in the future. But it's something to be reasonably expected somewhere along those lines. SEP IRAs are for self-employed small businesses. They're kind of strange. It's 25% of your earnings, but really not. It's actually a little bit less because you have to yeah, I don't, I don't really understand it myself. Um, simple IRAs are, uh, again, for the self-employer small businesses. These are actually quite nice. They're like 401ks, but they're a lot easier from a paperwork standpoint. So when I, when I consult with small businesses, I say, you know what? Don't go with a 401k. Go with the simple. It's a lot cheaper, a lot easier. You don't have the headache of the IRS breathing down your neck. The limit's not as much, but still, $12,500. That's a pretty darn generous limit. And 3000 if you're 50 or over. Simple 401k are popular. Simple 401ks are popular with people who only have one employee themselves. KEOs are a little old. You don't see them as much. And then there's the Roth IRA. Anyone with earned income, unless you earn too much money, but that's not true. We'll see in a few slides. The limits are the same as the tr traditional IRA. $5,500 and an extra 1000 if you are um, 50 or older. And then remember we said they call them the Roth 401k, the Roth 403b, but they're really not. That's not the legal name. That's what people call them. The IRS just says, it, says it's a 401k with after-tax contributions. And they all work basically the same. Tax break now for the first set until you get to the Roth tax break later. So here's an example. You are working at a company that has a 401k or a 403b, a nonprofit has a 403b. And you are convinced that this is a good idea. So you're in the 25% tax bracket. If you put $100 in via your paycheck, you're going to see that the feds and the state of California are going to be very generous to you. The feds are going to give you 25 bucks. The state's going to give you eh, six or maybe eight. Huh? No, they don't write you a check. What they do is they take 35 fewer dollars out of your paycheck to go to income taxes for the federal government. They take six dollars or eight fewer dollars out of your paycheck to go to the state of California. So you're getting a, for example, $33 subsidy. So you see your take-home pay only reduced by $67. Now, some companies match. So you put in 100 bucks, they might put in 25 or 50 or maybe even $100. That is free money. You should be taking advantage of that, dear students. Who is going to give you a 50% or 100% return on your investment in one day? 
Ain't no stock going to do that. No mutual fund, no bonds going to do that. Real estate's not going to do that. No, only your employer. And why? Because they don't want to have a traditional pension plan. So when people say, well, these, these 401ks are a whole lot cheaper to administer. Not if they do it well. If they're matching their employees' contributions, it costs them about as much as a traditional uh, pension plan, as a defined benefit plan. And so when they, one of these, these companies and, and some of the um, uh, public, um, public entities, uh, state, city, local governments, go to the from the traditional pension plan to a 401k plan, an employer-sponsored plan, they find that the, if they're doing it well, if they are matching, which is you know, something you really should do to encourage your employees, uh, they, they find that it's not that much cheaper. <laughs> so you get a hundred dollars, maybe a hundred fifty or a two hundred dollars worth of investments for only sixty-seven bucks. You see, your take-home pay only reduced by sixty-seven dollars, but the whole hundred dollars and maybe a match goes in the account. Okay, Piano, what's the catch? Right, there's always a catch. Right, nothing's free. Uh, slide sixteen. Well. You pay income tax on any amounts withdrawn in retirement. But that's okay because people in retirement are usually in a lower tax bracket. And you'll hear people, some people say, but what if I'm in a higher tax bracket? If you are, congratulations! You're making more money in retirement than you did when you're working. What are you complaining about? I hope, it is my sincerest desire that all my students, all my clients, on myself have this horrible champagne problem in their elder years oh dear we have too much champagne what shall we ever do plus folks this is money you're going to kiss and send on its little way and come back in 30 40 years to, to take a look at right if you withdraw the funds before retirement the IRS is going to tax you on the amount and hit you with a 10% penalty. So they're going to smack your little risk for for taking the money out early. Because the idea is you're building your own pension plan. You don't want to rate it. Now there are exceptions. First time home purchase, great. Higher education, okay, not ideal, but those are things that we know increase in value. Homes and, and education helps us with income. Medical disability, financial hardship, all right, yeah, it's an emergency. Aruba? Or Tahiti? No. No, 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 don't do it. <laughs> Slide 17. Now, what about the Roth IRA, the Roth 401k, the Roth 403b? How does that work? Well, you contribute to the Roth IRA 100 bucks. What do you get from the feds? <laughs> what do you get from the state of California? <laughs> Nothing. You don't get any subsidy. Your disposable income is reduced by 100 bucks. So why contribute to a Roth IRA? And this is what you're going to do, right? You're going to open up a Roth IRA. I know you are. Nod your head, yes. And your family, your friends are going to expect you to help them because they don't understand anything. So they're going to say, why do you contribute to a Roth IRA? And here's your answer. Are you ready? Slide 18. Because a Roth IRA is so cool. Tax-free in retirement is a golden opportunity. No other investment choice comes close, in my humble opinion. I believe that in about 10, 15, 20 years, the Congress is going to look around and go, uh-oh, what, what do we do? Because there will be billions and billions of dollars in Roth IRAs, and they can't tax them. So I think they'll just say, okay, no more Roth IRAs. You can't have any more. You have one, you can keep it, but you can't put any more in. Plus, the very cool thing is you can withdraw the contributions at any time. Why? You already paid taxes on the contributions. So, that money is yours. Not the earnings. If you take out the earnings, they'll tax you and hit you with a 10% penalty, except for the, uh, you know, the exceptions that we talked about in the previous slide. This makes the Roth IRA also an excellent intermediate term investment account. You can use it for purchase of a house or college expenses. It's very cool for college expenses because when you filled out that FAFSA form, many people say FAFSA, but it's FAFSA form, did they ask you how much was in your Roth IRA? Did they ask how much was in your parents' Roth IRA? No, they don't. Currently, as the law stands, 
Now, if you go to a public, inst a private institution, a private college, sometimes they say, how much is in your Roth IRA? Dame lo. Give it to us. You know, dame nos. Um, don no, don no, I can't say it. Don no slow. <laughs> Give it to us. Uh, some people don't trust the Roth IRA. They say, you know what? Don't trust those bums in Washington. 10, 15, 20 years from now, they'll find a way to tax it. Uh, I don't know. You, you could, you know, maybe they might. I, there'll be an awful lot of gray haired people with their canes b coming after the Congress people if that happens. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But how do you, you know, I don't, I don't think so. We'll see. Slide number 19. Now see if you can follow me on this because it is a doozy. A Roth IRA is not for everyone. Well, yes it is. You just have to learn how to navigate the paperwork. And I've done it for several people. It's not that hard, but it is bizarre. Only single taxpayers with an adjusted gross income of $117,000 or less in 2016, it goes up with inflation. And married couples with an adjusted gross income of $184,000 or less in 2016 can fully contribute to a Roth IRA. After that, they phase out the contribution until after a certain amount you can't contribute at all. And if you don't qualify, I don't feel too badly for you. Congratulations, in fact. But you can still contribute to the Roth IRA any, anyway. If you find that you've made over the limit, you can recharacterize, that's the verb that the IRS uses, the contributions into a traditional IRA, which doesn't have the same limitations. Remember I talked about the confusion? Before you file your taxes, I think you can actually do it after you file your taxes. And then you convert the traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. You do it on the exact same day. You fill out all the paperwork in one day and submit it. I've done it many times. I know, I know who voted for these bozos. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> they got to fix this, folks. They just got to fix it. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But if you understood what I said, great. If you don't understand, don't worry about it. All you have to know is that even if you make over the amount, that is set for the limitation, you can still go ahead and do it. Bizarre. Is our tax code broken? <laughs> yeah. Slide 20. Just a couple more slides here, folks. Hang on with me. If you're a low-income earner, and I don't know about you, but these aren't that low income. 60000 61500 for a married couple? Not a bad salary, folks. Uh, you can get a tax credit for making contributions to your Roth IRA, your 401k. Not bad. 30700 for single filers. This is 2016. It goes up with inflation. If you do your own taxes, do not forget this. TurboTax, all the other programs, they, they handle it pretty well, so don't worry. If you have somebody else do them for you, make sure you remind them that you made contributions to a retirement account. And if they say, well, why should that matter? You need to find another person to do your taxes. Because a tax credit is very cool. It is a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction of income taxes. See? We like tax credits. Yes, we do. Slide 21. The Roth 401k. Excuse me. The Roth 403b. I'm ready for a break. If your employer offers the option, you are able to place the after-tax dollars into your 401k or 403b. The employer does not have to offer you this option. They are post-tax contributions like the Roth IRA. Now, any money that your employer matches, that is pre-tax. So there you go. You got two different types of monies in the account. You have to remember this. Because if you don't, you go to take the money out, the IRS will say it's all taxable. And you can't take out the contributions uh, before retirement as you could with the Roth IRA, right? You, they won't let you do it. This option is popular with workers in lower tax brackets because they don't need the tax break now. I like the Roth IRA better because it's just easier. You don't have to worry about you know how much is in post-tax and pre-tax. But if your employer matches, then... That's free money. you got to take advantage of that, folks. You can't just let that money sit on the table. So watch for that at your work. Whew. Whew. Here we are, folks. 
We have gone through the um, um, the most popular and most uh, common tax uh, not tax qualified retirement accounts, and we are ready to end our presentation by looking at what the Social Security recommends. The Social Security Administration recommends for your anticipated sources of retirement income. Notice that they only want you to use about a quarter of your income or, or get a, I'm sorry, get a quarter of your income from Social Security. You understand? Yes. It was never meant to be the sole source. So next time somebody yells and screams about how Social Security and they can't make ends meet, don't please don't be mean to them, but do say, well, you know, sir or madam, it was only meant to be one quarter of your income, not the entire amount. Okay, fine. And they might slap you. Who knows? Um, <laughs> that's why you need to get started now. So you're not one of them that believes that Social Security is going to take care of you. In our next presentation, we will deal with a... Uh, it's actually a... It's an interesting topic, from especially people who like to think about demographics, the study of, of populations and the like. It's called the Baby Boomer Generational Time Bomb. And it sounds scarier than it really is. So we'll see you in our next presentation and see that it's not as bad as it, people make it out to be. See ya! Oops, oops, oops. I forgot to tell you, I my apologies, that in the face-to-face -face class that we would show you an illustration that shows you how to take money out of your retirement plans in chapters 10 11 12 13 we all we talked about how to build up the nest egg for retirement but how do you take it out well it turns out it's not that easy there are many different uh, uh plans many different uh, strategies and we'll show you just one so please do take a look at that. My apologies for forgetting to tell you that. Bye. <laughs>